There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you behind the scenes at America's top museums. Today we're in the DuPont Circle area of Washington, D.C. at the Phillips Collection, America's first museum of modern art. Founded in 1921 by Duncan Phillips and his wife Marjorie, they both played an important role in introducing America to modern art. This Georgian Revival house, listed on the National Registry of Historic Houses, was the Phillips family home until they moved out in 1930 to create more room for their ever-expanding art collection. They collected with equal focus American and European artists such as Renoir, Van Gogh, El Greco, Matisse, Monet, Picasso, Miro, and Georgie O'Keeffe, among many others. Today we'll learn about American artist Jacob Lawrence. Born in New Jersey in 1917, he moved to Harlem at the age of 13. There he discovered that he loved art and he began painting, having his first exhibition at the Harlem YMCA. Two years later, he began his migration series, a 60 panel series that portrays the great migration of over one million African Americans from rural south to industrial north between World War I and World War II. This important series of paintings depicts struggle, adversity, hope, and triumph. Then we'll take a behind the scenes look into the private conservation area to learn about Lawrence's materials and techniques and see some of the challenges conservators face and the tools that they use to restore artwork, including an infrared microscope. So let's begin our journey on America's great migration north through the eyes of Jacob Lawrence. Let's go. So Elsa, tell me about this spectacular space that we're in now. This is so cool. This is a wonderful space. And if you can imagine, it was the, the rec room for oh. Duncan Phillips and his brother James. His parents added this space to the original home in 1907. So the house had been built at the turn of the 19th century. They bought the property. And then in 1907, they decided to add this beautiful addition. And we now get to enjoy it as not only a gallery space, but also a space for our music program. We have a wonderful series of concerts on Sundays that has a long, long cherished history that dates back to 1941. Well, and I also noticed when I was coming in that there was this interesting little carriage house in the back. Is that another outreach program for the Phillips Collection? Yes, that is uh, now been transformed into the Center for Art and Knowledge with the University of Maryland. So since 2015, the Phillips Collection has had a wonderful partnership with the University of Maryland. And as a part of that, we have classes there, we have fellowship program, we have wonderful artist conversation series that might take place in the evening. So nice. it's, yeah. it's a really wonderful addition to our ongoing activity here in the, in the museum. So let's talk about the intimacy, which is I think one of the strongest points of this museum and the way art is displayed in this historical part of the museum. One of the fascinating things I think about our history is that when Duncan Phillips founds the museum, he's still living in the home, and that's really, really unusual. He did not want to wait till he passed away, let's say, mm -hmm. as you see in some other cases with other museums, but he wanted to share right away. So the first part of our history, for the first nine years, uh, he had the museum located in an upstairs gallery. But by 1930, he realized that he could only show such a small number of works. It was so limiting, and his collection had grown to about 600 works by 1930. He contemplated having a whole new museum built, and guess what? Hmm. He decides to abandon that idea altogether, and he says, I'm moving out because there's something so special about experiencing art in the intimacy of a domestic 
home. And it was a place artists really came and spent hours. And that was important to Duncan, wasn't it? that artists were communicating with each other, even within the collection they seemed to communicate, but what was his philosophy as far as the type of art that he was collecting? Well, Duncan Phillips believed that American art was on par with the European art. So he carried the weight on both shoulders, but he felt very strongly that he wanted to show the two together. Not in isolation, which really is the traditional model mm -hmm. that many museums have their American wing and American galleries, even to this day. But from the beginning, in a really radical way, to demonstrate also the universality of art, that it really is important to see how art can talk to each other across time and geography. So he collected and showed, similarly, beautiful works of art by American artists and modern European artists in dialogue. This was not a collector who was looking to collect in a comprehensive way. I need to represent every part of yeah. our history in the tradition of art but it was so personal for him. It was all about the work that really spoke deeply to him. And to his wife, Marjorie, correct? Was she not an artist yes. also? Yeah. Yes, yes. I had to have impacted the collection. He, he talks about this and his one advisor was his wife. He will only acknowledge in a collection in the making, he, 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 he does give her a lot of credit and also the fact that she was an artist, he absolutely trusted her eye and her opinion and she served as the assistant director here. She had an active role in running the museum and in the exhibition programs, and then she became director upon his death. So she absolutely was uh, an important partner. Shall we go to the more modern part of the <laughs> museum? Of course, sure. Thank you. All right. So here we are in the more modern part of our museum. And we have other wonderful works from the permanent collection on view, the, the beautiful Matisse interior oh. with Egyptian curtain, mm -hmm. um, which is a great pendant to a work by Pierre Bonnard, which is also another work we're featuring, The Open Window. We have our great jewel of the collection, the Renoir, luncheon of the boating party. You had a special exhibition also. I know there are many here, but wasn't one of them on the voting party? We absolutely yeah. did, yes. We had a great exhibition that really looked at all the different people that are there enjoying their wonderful lunch outing along the banks of the Seine and were able to borrow a number of works to put it into context. And, and that's really a great kind of example of an exhibition that we can do that really broadens um, people's understanding of something in the collection that they, sure. they, they get to see, but not usually alongside other works. I saw a Van Gogh, and it was on display next to a Francis Bacon. Tell me what the thought process was for that. If you look at the way the grass is re rendered in the Van Gogh, and these beautifully expressive animated brush strokes mm -hmm. that you would imagine in a video. Sure, sure. And then you look at Francis Bacon's painting where there's just a huge field of blades of grass in the foreground, and those strokes are just so much parallel to what you see in the Van Gogh. I think that it, the fun of it, and what's really true to our mission that Duncan Phillips had, is the discovery of the excitement, so that you say, wow, why is Bacon next to Van Gogh? And then you might contemplate for yourself. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> why that might be, why would right. somebody who worked here, i.e. Yeah. a curator, put these two together? And sometimes it's sort of that, that discovery that we, you want people to have for themselves. But that's the fun of it and for it a curator, and it's the fun of it for a viewer. Yeah. So Jacob Lawrence has an exhibition at the YMCA in Harlem. How does he go from there to being responsible for this incredible epic migration series. He is only 21 years old when he's aye, aye, aye. beginning yeah. to conceive yeah. of this idea to do, to take on this subject which had never been tackled in paint. And it was such an important part of America's history that he felt he wanted to be a part of telling this story. And mm. his ambition was for this series to be, to be shown in schools. So he was looking for funding to be able to afford to spend the time that it was going to take to tell this story artistically? Yes. I think that that uh, the grant, going back to your point, definitely is going to give him the liberty and the luxury of time 
um, to be able to support himself. He gets his first studio as a result of the grant, and he really sets to work. And it allows him, in over a year's time, which is pretty remarkable, to have finished the series. The series begins at the time of World War I, 1914. He's coming to Harlem, it's 1930, just to give you an idea. Okay. So the migration is, is still going on. Sure. Um, and the first panel does really show the crowds going to the train station, I'm assuming. Tell yes. Me, tell me about that first panel. Yes, so I think that's exactly where he starts off, knowing that the trains were one of the great vehicles for the migration, sure. in addition to buses, but certainly the trains were major players in allowing people to make that move. And so the first panel, he picks three of the major destinations for the migration north. New York, Chicago, and St. Louis. I think if we move on, we can look at, for example, one of my favorites, um, because it's got such deep pathos to it. It's a scene that shows a mother cutting a slab of a fatback with a young child anxiously looking forward to a meal. Actually um, leaning forward. And really yeah. leaning, leaning into the table. He's skin and bones. You can tell that this is a very, you know, a hungry child because of the harsh conditions there. A situation where the mother is able to afford more than what was considered one of the cheapest slabs of meat. And then you move along and you uh, emphasize the segregation that w in the next panel with the separate drinking fountain. A very clever way of, of suggesting that we're all really alike. Why are we different? Because the two women, they're dressed exactly alike. Oh, yeah. And so what's different? All that's different is that one's white and one's black. And one of the things that the migrants are hoping is that when they move north, that the discrimination will be less. Um, we're getting close to the midway point in the series, so we're looking at a train station. Lawrence is choosing to focus on the fact that a lot of families had to be separated as a, a result of migration with the, the fathers, the men, typically being the ones that would go ahead first to first get settled, get jobs, and then send for the rest of the family. I see. The big driver for migration was to come north and work in the big industries um, of manufacturing. For example, the steel industry is represented here with Pittsburgh. And so out the window, you see the smokestacks. Oh, yeah. um, but we're looking in the car of a train with this wonderful scene of uh, looks like a family with young children. Baby on the laps, um, yeah. <laughs> yep, two little babies on the laps. They're arriving north with a lot of hope and enthusiasm. And I see um, a smile. A, I, I, I haven't seen a smile yet. Yeah. I think there's this sense here that they're hopeful at this point. They've heard about what, what may await them. Um, they've been obviously, you know, drawn to come north with the hope that they'll, they'll have a better life. Well, I love this because it is so hopeful. Because as we move down a couple more panels, <laughs> it's looking like the reality isn't quite what they might have thought. That's right. You'll see that even though it's north, um, they're not, they're away from the Jim Crow South, but in a restaurant now, we're looking and you see the cordoned off line. Yes, right down the middle. Right down the middle. And you have tables on the right that have the African Americans enjoying a meal and tables on the left where you have, in this case, you see the single male figures um, enjoying a meal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it speaks to the fact that it really didn't go away um, mm -hmm. uh, when they went north. There still were lots of racial tensions. Mm -hmm. um, that's a scene to show that some of the harsher realities of life even as they came north. But as we go down and they're still up north, you wouldn't have expected racial tensions in this panel. Explain what's happening here. Yeah, so in this panel, uh, 53, you see a really dolled up, very fine looking couple, uh, an yeah. African American are couple. These the rural, are these folks from the rural <laughs> south? And so, no. no, so this is showing you the fact that when they came north, there had already been long time roots of immigration. There were lots of, of, of people that had already made the journey to the north. Um, before the Great Migration, before World War I. They too sometimes were meeting the new influx of migrants with a little bit of 
disdain and snobbery. You see the woman, this be just beautifully rendered artistically, this beautiful boa. Beautiful Look at pattern that. on her beautiful dress. Beautiful yes. pattern. Um, the, and he's the got the gentleman. cane, the walking cane. The walking yeah. cane, white gloves, gloves yeah. top hat. Um, and so it is interesting that, you know, this is another side that, that was true to life that, that Jacob Lawrence wanted to, yeah. to incorporate. Part of the struggle. Part, of the, part struggle. of the struggle. And then when we get towards the end, the last panel that we have here, panel 59, the freedom to vote. Like all of these, there can be these sort of veiled references in them if you really look, because at the same time that it's suggesting a freedom, there is this police officer stationed there looking very ominous. Um, and I think that there is clearly intimidation, even if they have the right to vote. There are just a lot of aspects of this, of this story of hope and struggle um, and perseverance uh, that we still really see today. See today. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. This has been an incredible view in the slice of our American history. Thank you. Thank you. So Lily, we were downstairs looking at the, the great migration series, which yes. is great, and I see you have one of the pieces here, and I'm dying to hear I about do. Do. his materials and techniques, and I see you've got a microscope here. Tell, tell me sure. what we're looking at here. Sure. I know it was, sure. what's so, the medium, first so, of all? So it is Casein Tempera, and he made his own paints for this series. and. He, because it was such a big undertaking, he had to be very methodical about it. And there were drawings that he made that he transferred the drawing to the, the gesso panels. And what were the panels? Were they masonite? They were, yeah, board, masonite, just, hard, okay. hardboard. He got from okay. the just from a hardware just store. And he made it. He, yeah. he and Gwen made up the gesso. Gwen was his wife. Gwen was his okay, wife. So he applied it himself. And then transferred the drawing onto the panels. He applied all the black colors first then all the brown colors. I don't know exactly the order, but he says he went from dark to light. But I like this panel in particular because it not only shows how methodical he was, but how he could also be very sort of free with his brushwork. And this is just, the, I think, such an excellent example. This woman's, I guess this is some sort of fur. It looks like fur a fur coat around her neck and a feather. And a uh, with a, like a boa. And when you look at it through the microscope, which is a lot of fun, you can see how free this brushwork is, and there's no underdrawing here. This is one of the things that we use a microscope for often, is to find underdrawing, and I believe in the cane. So you saw no underdrawing so, yeah, in, in the, the pattern okay, on her dress. Right here, yeah. Leslie, if you want to look in the corner, you can see the cane, mm -hmm. and you can see the pencil, uh, traced pencil underdrawing oh, yeah. on either side of the cane. Sure. Yeah. But then if you move over and you look at this, this brushwork. This is all just just freehand, oh, and so, so it's sort of that combination yeah, of yeah. spontaneity along with precision. And you can tell how he fast used, he did. How have fast to do he that did because it. it's yeah. not like a yeah. solid yeah. stroke. Yeah. It's broken. Exactly. Yeah, it's really pretty. So, so this uh, is a very handy tool yes. for conservators. Conservators. I'm yes. Yeah. yeah. We we use the microscope a, a lot to to look at pictures. You know, the first thing when we when we bring any painting into the conservation student we probably look at it on the easel first but then we bring it over and look at it on the microscope and we literally look at every square inch oh. up close to check to make sure that the painting is perfectly stable uh, nothing's lifting no are losses. you looking from the front or the back looking or from both the front. always oh, from the front always from the front then we look oh. at it from the back but not under the microscope necessarily I see. so this is what this is one of our most important tools i think the other most important tool which i always say is just our studio we have natural light. We have beautiful natural beautiful light. light. Yeah. And and you need that that good strong light to be able to to see the painting, see what you're working on. This is an unusual picture actually for the Phillips collection. It's an old master painting of which we only have a handful of them. But it's by Alessandro Manasco. He's a late Baroque painter. His dates were 1667 to 1749, I Whoa. think, something like that. It hasn't been touched since it came into the collection. And so uh, oh, since I think that. 1920, it, it hasn't been no, touched. No, it hasn't been touched. Wow. So uh, I've done some cleaning tests here. And uh, this looks to like you're with the trade. It here. is. So just, uh, just cotton swab and a, a bamboo stick. Uh, a little combination of, of solvents that we use that will remove the discolored varnish and also it has a layer of airborne grime on there but not remove the paint 
And so that's the trick, coming up with the combination of solvents. And would that change yeah. for every painting? Or yes, by for the every painting. You, so you really have to know the materials. You do, uh, the painter. To know what materials to use. Exactly, Whoa. exactly. And so we start out doing just little tests on the edges, and you can see what a huge difference oh my God, this is going to make. I can't believe the difference. When uh, the, it's got a very discolored yellowed varnish. There's also, I did a small team, just right in here along the mast. Oh, yeah. So you can see. So oh, this, this is, is exciting. Sing. Patty, tell me what we're looking at. I mean, I know it's a Picasso, but this is a beautiful piece. And where do you come in here in this process? This, uh, this painting is, uh, we call it the Blue Room. It's called the Blue Room. Um, it was painted in 1901. And the picture is um, thought to be of his uh, first studio in Paris. It was a studio slash apartment that he shared with his dealer. But the reason that this became of interest to us in the conservation studio is um, we were not the first to notice a uh, difference in texture. It's, uh, we have a letter um, from as, as far back as uh, 1954 that um, makes mention of the texture of the painting and how it doesn't match what we see in the composition. And so you'll see um, brush strokes in the painting, especially in, in raking light um, across the surface of the picture. Yeah, broad brush strokes, mm -hmm. yeah. And you see an, a lot of texture in this area which um, signals to us um, some kind of reworking on the part of the artist. Because it's more paint on the surface? Because it looks like little cracks too. Is that from layers of paint? Or we don't know yet. At this point you don't know. Exactly. I see. Yes, yeah. So the cracks could be from uh, changes that the artist made or just from age. Um, so yeah. we have to figure that out too. We have a couple of tools at our disposal. You've seen the microscope. Um, and we start there, and through the microscope you can see uh, different colors um, underneath the white and the blue that we see um, on the surface paint layers. And then we also are very fortunate at the Phillips to have um, an infrared camera. Um, and what infrared... Uh, That's it? This is it. This little wow. thing, this is the tripod that it's on. So infrared is, uh, what we see is the visible light, and infrared means beyond the red. So where we stop seeing red, this camera can see wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum beyond that range that we see with our eyes. You know, a blue will absorb everything, every other color and, and reflect blue, so we see blue. Mm -hmm. With um, it also, the materials, they um, selectively absorb and reflect and transmit infrared. And the sensor in this camera picks up the infrared light rather than the visible light. So when you <laughs> position this in front of a in front of a picture the information goes to a computer it goes to a computer and what happens is that um, depending on the materials in the painting um, we would be able to either see through the paint layers mm -hmm. it will reflect the light back or will absorb the light and so you get a, a black and white a contrasty black and white image well I'm anxious to see this on a computer screen can we take a look sure. at that now yeah So when we first started examining the picture with the camera, um, it's a relatively low resolution and so you need to um, take um, picture by picture and create a grid of pictures that you then stitch together. And how many pictures is that generally? Or generally varies? it varies with the size of the picture. Um, for a picture this size it would usually be maybe a hundred, um, but for this painting, um, I wanted really good resolution, so I got really close, and it was around 300. What was revealed? <laughs> we found a completely different painting Get underneath. Out. That's what was underneath it? We believe that this picture was painted in the same year. So this picture was also painted in 1901. Um, but as you can see, this is painted, so we believe this is painted probably in early um, summer of 1901, possibly. Oh, this is the same picture, and you just have it vertical. I just did. Okay, all right. It. Um, and you can see how much his style changes in just a matter of months. And being able to see, um, and there are a number of other pictures from this year that have other compositions beneath the painting that we see or on the other side of the canvas. And being able to study the hidden pictures gives us a better um, idea of 
the young Picasso sure. as an artist and his development um, during this sort of whirlwind uh, uh, time that he spent in Paris this early in his career. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, thank you so much for showing this. Sure. And, and good luck. I know it's en route to another <laughs> exhibition <laughs> at some point. So I know you saw the, the boating party downstairs, our, our most Beautiful. famous. That's, yeah. That's a highlight, of the, a highlight of the collection. It's a highlight of the collection. I've been studying the boating party for over 20 years, and it's, it's actually, it looks like it's so spontaneous. They're there, they're in the moment. He's like captured it like a photograph. But in fact, it's not. He labored over that composition a great deal. And almost every single model in the, in the composition was changed. One of the most astonishing changes is in the lower left corner, the figure of Eileen Sharago, the woman holding uh, the dog. And in the X radiograph, we find that it's a completely different sitter. She faces out to the viewer. You see her two eyes, her mouth. She's holding her arm uh, up against her torso and looking out at the viewer. And while Renoir is painting, the picture. He writes a letter to his friend Berard and he says, I'm obliged to go on working on this wretched painting because of a high class cocotte who had the impudence to come to Chateau wanting to pose. That put me a fortnight behind schedule and in a word, today I've wiped her out. We found her. Duncan Phillips understood that artists influence each other and their successors through the centuries and Jacob Lawrence understood the importance of using his artistic talents to tell the human story of a slice in life in America's history. He once said, to me, migration means movement. There was conflict and struggle, but out of the struggle came a kind of power, even beauty. And the migrants kept coming is a refrain of triumph over adversity. If it rings true for you today, then it must still ring a chord in our American experience. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time.